if you enjoy listening to this podcast and sometimes you find yourself talking back at me and my guests and you wish that you could get in on the conversation and have conversations about the sorts of things that we're talking about here, but you don't have people around you that you feel you could do that with, I want to encourage you to check out my weekly teacher's class. I created it for this very reason. It's mostly podcast listeners, and we're having these amazing conversations every week. This week, we talked about the way breath and bunda is taught in the TKB Desika Char tradition, which is the one I most closely align with, and liability waivers and liability insurance and whether or not you need it. We talked about producing online video. When should you do it and how do you do it? And lastly, we talked about the idea of resonance and where it fits into one's business plan and marketing strategies. The conversations are really useful and engaging. I'm super excited about this. If you want to get in on it, it's the J. Brown Yoga Weekly Teachers Class. You can find it at jbrownyoga.com. Hello there. I think it's time. What do you say? This is Jay Brown Yoga Talks Podcast. My name is Jay Brown. How is everyone? It's good to be with you again. That is, of course, if you're returning, maybe you're not, maybe you're new, in which case I would like to welcome you. I usually like to spend a little time here right at the beginning of an episode just checking in, you know, see how we are all doing. Well, really, I guess it's just me, right? I'm the only one with the mic in my face, so <laughs> I guess I'm really just checking in with how I'm doing. And I'm doing all right, all things considered. It feels like late summer to me, which always has this feeling of like, Life's momentum coming to a standstill for just a moment. But it's a very uncertain moment because you know it's not going to stay like that. That There's all this stuff that's about to come at us, but we don't know what it is yet. And we want to make sure that we're ready for it, but we're not even sure how to prepare because we don't know what's coming or when it's coming. And maybe that's just me. Maybe I'm projecting on you right now. But that's the way I feel like I got to be ready, but I'm not sure for what. (laughs) And I suppose ultimately I'm just going to focus in on the efforts that I can identify as having clear benefit for myself and for others, you know? And if I put my efforts there and I do it with my whole heart and a true intention, then I'm just going to have to have faith that I will be ready for whatever comes and that things are going to happen as they happen in whatever way that is. So ultimately, I guess there's a high degree of faith to all of this, isn't there? (laughs) Now, the other thing that's been going on with me, and I know this might be of interest to some of you, but not others. I know there's a lot of you out there who are parents like me. Well, my eldest daughter started school. I mentioned that last week. I recorded like the day before her first day back. And so she's back at school and we like her new teacher and, you know, there wasn't any like problems, but she has matured a lot over the summer. Those of you who are listening back when we were at the Feathered Pipe Ranch and then we visited my in-laws and in all these places we visited, my eldest daughter, Rosin, had was given like lots of freedom to be independent. So now we're back and like she wants to walk home from school by herself. And you know, the school's just down the street and, and it's a safe neighborhood and we, we chose the neighborhood because we wanted to live in a place that we felt like our daughter could walk to school on her own and we wouldn't worry. But, you know, she's eight. She, she's turning nine in two months. And it's like, when, when do you decide, you know? And there's kind of a split, it seems to me, among the parents and her 
in her class. Like some parents are already letting their kids do it and some parents are not. And so I think we've decided to go ahead and, and let her have this independence. But I guess I didn't feel totally comfortable because I went and I bought her one of these things, these uh, gizmo gadgets. Do you guys know what these are? They're like these um, watches, essentially, that um, you can make calls and texts to, but you can totally control it for your kids. So, like, they can only call you. They can't call anybody else. And they can only use pre-written text messages because there's no, like, keyboard on it. It's mainly just a way for her to call us or us to call her or us to send messages back and forth. And we can track her. There's, like, the GPS so we can see where she is. I never had, like, a GPS tracker on me when I was a kid running around my neighborhood. But... I don't know, I guess it definitely makes me feel better even in that there's a way for her to get in touch with us if she needed to, you know? It's not like there's any pay phones around that she could pick up. I remember at one point my mom used to make me carry a quarter around just in case I needed to call her, you know? But (laughs) now there's no pay phones. So I got her this thing and I'm going to let her walk home from school. So I don't know why I'm telling you all this. Just like I said, I'm checking in and I'll just been thinking about that all day and I'm wondering out there how how many of you out there have kids who are like nine who you let run all around on their own or not I know like in previous generations people just let their kids run all over nowadays there's always like helicopter parenting so I don't know (laughs) for whatever that's worth to anybody who has any interest in that most of you are wondering When are we going to get to the talk with Larry Payne, man? And that's a very good question. We're going to get to it. I'm super happy to be finishing up these episodes on TKV Desica Char. And I want to express some special thanks to Leslie Kamenov. I know I keep dropping his name, but that's because he's really responsible for these. He's the person who really got me in touch with all these fantastic people and put in a good word so that they were willing to come on and talk to me. So I'm, I'm super grateful to Leslie for, for that and just for his work in general. Not only is he a friend, but he also happens to be a sponsor of this podcast. He has an online education resource called yogaanatomy.net. And it's something that I can really stand behind because I've taken his course In fact, I'm always saying this, but you can see for yourself that I've taken his course. If you take it yourself, if you go online and do his principles course, you'll see me. I'm part of the group that they used for the online course. And it's just an invaluable resource. If you need to study yoga anatomy or you just want some deep yoga learning, I highly recommend it. Go to yoganatomy.net. Now, today's podcast with Larry Payne was so much fun. I'm just, I'm, I'm bursting over with excitement to let you hear it because you'll hear right off the bat, we have a West Coast boy vibe, I think. I don't know. I, I'm assuming that he's a West Coast born guy. I didn't actually ask him that, but I'm born from the West Coast. Some of you know that I, I was born in Los Angeles and I moved to New York, and I've been in New York now longer than how long I lived in Los Angeles, and I have no desire to go back to the West Coast. I I really feel better living here on the East Coast, but I will sometimes say this thing, which I think is true, that you can take the boy out of LA, but you can't take all the LA out of the boy, and I think that's certainly true for me, and when I was talking with Larry, the LA boy in me just came out really easy and he's just such a pioneer in yoga and he really set the stage for a lot of what's happening now and you're going to get to hear about it today. 
Before we do, let me drop my stuff real quick. I'm going to be in Hamilton, New Jersey, September 15th. I'm going to be in Burlington, Vermont, September 22nd and 23rd. And I'm going to be in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, September 29th and 30th. You can find out about those gigs and more. You can listen to the archives of this podcast and read my blog and find my online yoga video offerings, my weekly teacher's class, my live stream subscription to my weekly public classes, my DVD and downloads for home practice, and my online workshop, Gentle is the New Advanced. All of that stuff can be found at jbrownyoga.com. All right then, y'all, I will touch base with you on the other side. I do have some exciting things to report as far as who's coming on in the future, so you can check in with me on the other side of this talk with Larry to hear about that. For now, let's do this. Let's hear this talk that I had with Larry Payne. Hello, is this Larry? Yeah, Jay? Yes. Uh, did you, you, see, you got my email? I did get your email, so you've got no power in your building. Is that the story? No, and they just, they just uh, sent a notice around that. Um, it, they don't know why, but it's not going to be coming up quickly. <laughs> so we, we could do this um, on the, uh, you know, the, the cell phone with the buds. Or if you want me to drive to my office and do it uh, uh, there, we could do that. I mean, how many bars you got on your cell right now? I don't even know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was just sort of... I mean, it's, it's recently charged. Yeah. No, I was sort of like... It's charged all the way. Because you sound okay right now, so we could just go with it. Are you, are you not on any earbuds right now? No, I can put the earbuds in. You want to see what that sounds like? You go ahead and put those in. Hang on. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Is that better or? Yeah, I think that is better. Other... Okay. Those those mics on those earbuds, they spent billions of dollars developing that technology. So we're going to take advantage of it. All right. Now, do you go by J? I do go by J. My name is Jason, okay. but there's always been another Jason Brown who teaches yoga in New York. So I started going by Jay oh, a long while back. All right. Well, fuck that guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like this conversation already. There. I like this already. All right. Cool. So I, I, have, I have a full, it looks like I have fully charged. So this, I hope that it makes it. Yeah, no, I, I was thinking more about the reception, but I think we're going to be okay. I mean, how far away is your office, just out of curiosity? Uh, 20 minutes, and so by the time I walk in and set it up, probably 25 minutes. Uh, let's just go with this. I think it'll sound okay. okay. I think it'll be fine. Is the reason right. your power out because of fires? No, uh, they said it's some type of an emergency thing with Edison. Oh. <laughs> the fuck that means. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we'll go with this. I can hear you okay, and I think it'll sound fine. Cool. But okay, other, other than the fact that your power is out, how's your morning been going? Uh, uh, the power out, very good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, mm, it's fun for me to get to talk to you. I spoke with um, Richard two days ago, and I spoke with Gary yesterday. Oh, that's a big company. Yeah, well, it's been really great after being at the conference at Kripalu to have these conversations. And the one thing that stands out most to me is that it is really such a clear example of how, you know, Desikachar taught different things to different people based on, like, mm -hmm. who they were and what their interests are and what their needs are. So these students of Desikachar's who had these very personal relationships to him, they they learn different things. And so I, I definitely, th I think you'll find that with Christian Macharia too. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. I think Jessica Char was trying to carry on what he saw his father doing. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, it's interesting to me because it explains why I think the tradition is sort of difficult to nail down, like what defines it mm -hmm. uh, because it, 
it, it doesn't have like a set thing so much. Although Gary tends to have a view that's a little uh, particular. Um, it's just interesting to me how diverse the people who study with them are and how the work that they've done has gone in, you know, many different directions. And you, for me, to sort of start, I, I've always had you in a, like a, your own category. I followed you. Are, are, we, are we recording now? Oh, yeah, we're recording now. Is oh, that, okay. oh, great. great. Is that Hi, okay? Everybody. Yeah, I normally just start, start <laughs> yeah, talking yeah. and just let it go, All you right. know. Is that okay? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, cool. So, um, you know, I, I remember when I first sort of started learned about yoga therapy a little bit. It was maybe around 2007. I had heard of it, but it's when I first started really looking at it. And I think you already had Yoga Therapy RX by then, right? Mm-hmm. And I just thought you had such a, a really tightly um, put together thing. Like you had your own really specific niche that was doing its own thing that seemed kind of in a way separate from what I think of now as kind of like mainstream yoga industry, like with the way Instagram came about and stuff. And it was before the internet really hit. And it's interesting to me that I, I, when I looked at your bio and I heard you speak at the conference, that maybe some of the reason you did have such a tight thing is because you knew how to advertise stuff. You were an advertising guy before you got to yoga. <laughs> I didn't really know that. And when I heard you talk about that, you know what came to mind is that show Mad Men. Was that like you? I, you, was, you I, like, was, I was there. Yeah. But I wasn't one of those guys. I was never a big drinker. Okay. And, uh, but I, I had to take those guys out to lunch. Yeah. And, um, uh, I don't know how far afield you want to go with this, but I remember, uh, that what really made me turn when, you know, I was taking yoga and I was still working at McCall's magazine. I was the West coast manager of advertising sales or marketing like that, you know? And, uh, the, I went to a meeting for top salespeople. They would always have these special things. They'd take you to an island because you've been doing really good, you know? So we get there, and every person there had a nervous tick. <laughs> I mean, including me, had it to twitch, you know, because there's so much pressure on you. you. You never had regular hours, and the more you did, the more they would give you until you could just bust, you know? And I saw everybody with a nervous tick, and then they handed out these baseball bats, small ones, with a plaque. I still have it. It says, nice guys finish last. Oh. <laughs> and just recently, um, we had a yoga day in Malibu, California. And at the end of the yoga day, we were having a ceremony and going around the circle. You often doing yoga and everybody saying something to the group to say goodbye. And by the time it got two thirds of the way to me, I started crying <laughs> because it just hit me that I, I made the right move. You know, I like the difference between being in a group where they hand out baseball bats mm-hmm. and say, nice guys finished last. And then being in a group of people, where everybody said, Oh, you changed my life. And I love everybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, that baseball bat makes me think of this t-shirt my dad had in the eighties. My dad was like a, businessman in real estate development in the eighties. And he had a shirt that said, he who dies with the most toys wins. Yeah. No, I saw that. <laughs> and I, I just remember that shirt and like my life has distinctly gone a direction different than that so, <laughs> yeah, by design. So I, I hear you. And, and I guess that is sort of what moved you in a different direction initially. Like that's interesting because that was advertising before the internet too. You know, I think things have changed oh, a lot, but. Well, you know, another thing talking about yoga business, that there are very few yoga teachers who have a business gene, mm-hmm. you know, a marketing gene. They just don't. Right. And so that's why I was asked to do so many things. And also just to be clear, I think I, I have a, 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 a niche with, you know, setting up things and, and coming up with ideas, but I cannot be the guy at the door collecting money because I let everybody in for free. Mm-hmm. You know? So I have, I'm not a, I don't have the killer business gene. I just have 
the marketing, you know, promotional savvy, you know, and um, this is why Death Guitar, I mean, talk about him recognizing and doing different things. After I was there the second time, he asked me if I would do a tribute to his father in America, the first tribute. Mm -hmm. That's a big deal. Well, wait, let's go back to the first trip first. So when do you, when do you first really start going to yoga? You you say you're doing yoga even while you had the advertising gig, but what was the first yoga? I know you went through a bunch of different teachers, right? You studied with Mr. Yungar and Yogi Bhajan. Where did it start? What was your first yoga teacher? Well, my really first start is that I, I, you know, while I was in advertising, I had a back problem uh, that just wouldn't go away. And, you know, Los Angeles has some great doctors and physical therapists and so forth. And this thing did, felt like a dog bite in my butt. It was there for about a year. So my running partner, Bill Grant, dragged me to a yoga class. I mean, literally dragged me. And fortunately, it was a, a, an older woman who was a disciple of Indra Devi. Her name was Renee Taylor. And I looked around the room and people were warming up and I said, I can't do that stuff. And she says, just do what you can. <laughs> a lot of people have heard this story, but it's true, you know. Do what you can and, and you'll get a big surprise at the end. <laughs> so I just did what I could and she did like a 10-minute shavasana. And at the end, that back pain, that dog bite was gone. It lasted for four hours. And I felt like I'd been smoking something. I was very high. I'll never forget it. And I have never looked back. Mm. You know, I found a yoga teacher in closer to where I live, Solomon Delgado, Raghavan Das. And um, he, you know, um, started having, you know, juice fast on the weekend. And then I got interested in that. And then that led me to take a, a two-week juice fast. And uh, I met the father of holistic health in America, Everett Loomis. And uh, just going through that fast is what led me on my soldier to go to around the world, really, like probably like 11 countries and end up in India the first time. For your question about my first time with Descatar, I was on a soldier around the world. I didn't even know who Descatar was. Mm. Yeah, you talked about that and about how you landed in, like, Rajneeshland first. <laughs> that was funny. That was funny because that recent uh, documentary came out. So you, you passed oh, wow, by that wow, on your yes, way yes, to Deskachar, huh? Yeah, I, I, I passed by that. I, I, my first teacher training in India, my first thing I arrived was the Shivananda, and it was brand new, deep in the south of India. And when I went in, they they were calling me. They had an Indian name for white man. You know, that's how it was just so remote mm-hmm. in an area called Mayor Dam. And so that was my first thing. It was a month, and it was so deep in meditation. And you, you don't even, they wouldn't let you eat onions or garlic because you would think of sex. And I go into Pune, and I have Rajneesh. <laughs> wow. That's quite a contrast. But you're getting a full spectrum there. Uh, yeah, I, I, re- I really did. And they, you know, they loved the press. So I still, I was on sabbatical from McCall's Magazine. So I was the guy from McCall's, from California, mm. you know, with a tape recorder, the camera. And they went after me. I see. And they had... This is before they moved to California, right. uh, or excuse me, to Antelope, Oregon. And so this was the, the beginning, and, and this was a full-on sexual revolution, just full-on. And they had this thing they called the Tantra Circle. So they wanted me to go join this circle. And I told you that story and <laughs> when I was at the Death Guitar Tribute, and I thought, why not? I mean, I, it was before AIDS. I was divorced, if the, you know. But I, I was so deep from the yes. even under, I couldn't do it. Yeah, well, you know, it's so funny. I've had Harish Wallace on. He's like a scholar of Tantra. And I know he would take some issue with calling what they were calling a Tantra circle. <laughs> oh, of course. <laughs> yeah. Of course. Wow. But so I guess, what do you know, what year was it? Was it like, it was early 70s at that time? 
No, it was the early 80s. Early 80s. It was like January, January of 1980. He hadn't moved to Antelope yet. Okay. And uh, so but it you, was like, you but know, you you passed on the Tantra circle. Yeah, yeah and, I did. And you went back to Shiva and Nanda, and then further in that same journey, you landed at Krishnamacharya. No, I didn't. I didn't go. I didn't go back to Shiva Nanda. I, what I did in the same town was Iyengar. Mm. And there's the other famous story that you may have heard is that you know Richard Miller and I uh, were in India at the same time. And there were these aerogram things. And everybody would respond to these envelopes that were folded over and called aerograms. So Richard sends an aerogram to BKS Iyengar and says, um, you know, I'm here from California and I'm observing different teachers and I'd like to come and observe your class. <laughs> and Iyengar sends me back an aerogram and says, Nobody observes my class. I recommend you go somewhere else. So I see this. So I said to him, I, based on this, I said to him, Dear Mr. Ango, I've come all the way from California just to be at your feet and study with you. I've heard so many great things. But uh-huh. he says me back, oh, oh, please come. I don't know if I can teach you anything, but I'll try. Oh, my God. <laughs> see? You knew how to do it. Yeah. You knew how to jump through that hoop so. properly. Interesting. Very interesting. So yeah. you studied with him. What was that like at that time? I, he was he was a very dedicated man. You know, it was beautiful. I mean, he gave me, like, royalty treatment. Mm. Uh, he had three groups. This is 1980, you know, January time. And he had a beginner's group. He had an intermediate and then he had a therapy class. So he took me to all three of those classes and let me participate. And he also gave me a private lesson. And um, I was there for a couple of weeks. And um, uh, the funniest one, though, was, you know, I was young. I was 40. So I could still, you know, I could do this and that. So um, he, his level two class, warmed up with standing drop over back bends. Like, that was where he started, you know? eh? <laughs> That's how you warmed up for the class. So I had to be in the bathtub every morning just to be able to move. <laughs> I was so sore. <laughs> wow. Wow. But the, the, the thing that, uh, that was interesting at that time was that Iyengar... He was too strong, like, for me. It's like, uh, in the mannerism, everybody was yelling at everybody. And it was, like, really screaming, you know. And then the, the, he'd scream to his kids, and his kids would scream to us. And, they, you know, it was like, and it was it was like being in martial arts, I mean, for me, personally. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was a very loving man. He was very dedicated. But I didn't like that type of thing, you know. And... Uh, and Des Kachar was the opposite. He was very, like, intellectual, very kind. Um, not to say that Iyengar wasn't kind, but just how he treated the class and how they, you know, like, just yelled at each other. And I, I look back, and it, it really, I guess, it comes from his teacher, Krishnamacharya, because Krishnamacharya was called the Lion of Mysore. Mm-hmm. And I saw in some of Leslie's early, like, dialogues with people that there was a man he was having a dialogue with that said that Krishnamacharya would beat his students right, in front of people and things like that. So it's like, you know, I think the strong thing came from Krishnamacharya. But now here's Deskachar, all right? His father is Krishnamacharya. His uncle is Iyengar because... Krishnamacharya married Iyengar's sister, and that's how Iyengar got to study with Krishnamacharya. Mm-hmm. So, how you know what kind of teacher is he going to be? You know, so he, sort and of he was treated the, very you know, poorly. Was, the accounts are that Mr. Iyengar was treated not so nicely by Krishnamacharya as a boy at all. Well, you, you hear the same thing from Patabi Joyce. Yeah, he said very tough teacher. You know, they all respected him. But he was tough on him, and he would say things like, you know, never praise your students. 
and stuff like that. And it was like, wow, you know, <laughs> for us in America, that's not so great, you know. Well, it was like a lot of cultural stuff that was going on at that time. But I guess that's absolutely that's what I, I think that's where Desica Char seems to me to be a pretty inspirational figure because it seems like he was the one who maybe started taking it a little bit out of some of that cultural uh, dogmas or whatever you would call it, those, those ways of teaching and started teaching it more specific to Westerners. And that, and that didn't involve the same kind of like harsh uh, corporal punishment or whatever. I think it's true. And I think it started with how he dressed. Hmm. You know, he was an engineer until he was like in his twenties. And then he decided to be a teacher of yoga from his father and study with him. So, you know, other teachers that come around, they're all wearing kurtas, you know, the Indian shirts and everything. And Jessica Tarr is, you know, tucking his shirt in and wearing a, you know, like a, like engineer outfit or something. And so it was very, he was much more Western Mm -hmm. in all of his approaches. He was, uh, you know, and he, he was not so big on big groups doing things together. Iyengar like flourished in huge numbers and so forth. Where Descatar, I think he really liked to have small groups and, um, or one to one, really know, one. Yeah. One to one was his, really his thing. Mm-hmm. And his whole book, you know, heart of yoga was about your personal practice and where do you get that personal practice from your teacher? You know, Right, and the relationship. So, I just talked with Gary quite a bit about that, the relationship aspect of it. I see here in your bio, before we continue, I want to talk more about Desika Char, but I see also that you studied with Yogi Bhaijan. Did you study with him before or after Desika Char? After, and I didn't really study with him. Okay. Uh, what it is is that uh, I interviewed him, Hmm. And um, I, I knew a lot of his family. I knew his son, Ron Beer. They, they had a restaurant in um, L.A. on 3rd and Fairfax called the Golden Temple. Yeah. It was there forever. Yeah. Yeah. And and so I would always see his son there. And this thing came up with a book, and they wanted me to interview Yogi Bhajan. And then when I went in to interview him, um, it was uh, it was something. And also, I went to a few of his classes, but I was never I, a student of his. And for me personally, the Kundalini was too esoteric at that time for me. And I, I know a lot of people I have a lot of dear friends who are Kundalini teachers, mm-hmm. but uh, it, it, I, I wasn't attracted. So I didn't study with him. I admired him. Um, oh my God! You know he was so powerful and. Uh, when I went in to see him, you know, he was very kind to me. He knew who I was. You know, I was with an organization at that time. And then immediately when I told him I knew his son, then we, you know, we made a bond and all that. Um, but that guy, you know, people don't realize that he had a, a side security business that was like a million dollar business where he was doing protection for like even the uh, people in Washington. What? And he Yogi had, Bajan had oh, a, yeah. a bodyguard yeah. business. Oh yeah! Wow. And uh, Leslie and my personal friend Sherry Dharma was one of the bodyguards. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Carried a gun. You know, it's wow. like you know, it was serious. Then he also started Yogi Tea. Yes, he was very savvy. The teas, all kinds of stuff they did, right? Yeah. Yeah. Really. But he was definitely like this powerful figure. And um, I remember that, uh, you know, when there was something called unity in yoga. Mm-hmm. Leslie talked about it, yeah. Leslie and I were both associate directors of that. Uh-huh. And, you know, when all the teachers came and spoke at this thing, you know, something about him that he was like this power figure above everybody. I mean, he. He just really knew how to use uh, his power. He had this giant power ring, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the ring. It was the ring that gave him the power, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> but he was just one of many that I had a chance. So I didn't really study with. I mean, my gotcha. main people that I studied with were in India, Deskatar, A.G. Mohan, mm. 
and um, uh, Indra Devi, uh, and then the Shiva Nanda, you know, training that I took first. Right. Uh, but it, it became more and more desk guitar and Indra Devi, basically, for me. Well, it, I know when I talked with Richard and Gary, they both sort of said that after meeting Desa Kachar, it kind of changed things for them. Would you say that was true for you? Absolutely. And what do you, I mean, I ask them the same question, like what, what was it about Desa Kachar when you think about it now, was like the, the biggest thing that was the change for you that you got from him or that you saw in him? First, for me, it was how he made it personal. You know, Krishnamachari and Deskatar both said that the most important aspect in healing is the relationship between the teacher and the student. And he really showed me, and I'm sure everybody else, how to do that. You know, how to make that bond because the people have to have faith in you. Uh, and, you know, that, that relationship is the most important aspect. So from the time you meet the person, you know, uh, it starts. And, oh, my gosh, he was kind to me. Um, and he, he, when you study with him, when he took you on, he didn't take everybody. You know, when he took you on, he, he wanted to know about your family, uh, you know, all aspects of your life. Um, he got real personal. And then if he took you on, you would then have meals with his family. You would sit on the floor with him and his family. It was real. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I've heard from other folks too, that his sort of like process of teaching was that he didn't, he didn't offer much up unless you were inquiring. Was that your experience too? Oh yeah. <laughs> it was fun for me when we were at our event that Leslie put on in tribute to Desk Attorney, here the other people, <laughs> how they would, just, you know, sometimes he wouldn't say anything until you asked him, you know. Yeah. He wouldn't uh, try to lead you in any direction uh, until you asked for it. Right. You so just hang out and have dinner for, until you actually had something you wanted to ask him about. <laughs> he, he, that's how you be. So I asked him specifically for help with the lower back. Mm. That's what I asked him for. And so... If you are hearing this message, then you're listening to the free version of J. Brown Yoga Talks. To hear the rest of our conversation, please subscribe to Podcast Premium at jbrownyoga.com slash premium.